All right, well, take out your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians. We have been uh, just recently started the book of 2 Corinthians as a verse-by-verse study. That's what we do here at Calvary Chapel. We want to study God's Word verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter, all the way through there so we understand the whole counsel of God's Word and not just little pet doctrines, right? And 2 Corinthians is one of those great examples of why that's so good. Because on the surface, as you just kind of read devotionally, maybe through 2 Corinthians, I know I said when I started that uh, the first time I ever read it as a young Christian, I was like, why is, this, why is this even in the Bible? You know, I don't even know why this is here. It just didn't make sense to me. And, uh, but you know, it's so deep because it goes into the ministry. It talks about uh, interactions with each other within the church, within the body of Christ, uh, ways that we can upset each other and ways that we can kind of deal, deal with those divisions that we have in the church and, and make things right again. And, and so it's really just body of Christ kind of stuff, really. As uh, the first Corinthian letter, you know, Paul was really correcting them because of a very sinful situation that was going on at their church. They were having a lot of divisions in the church, a lot of problems, a lot of people fighting with each other, uh, people in sin and nobody rebuking them of, of that sin and just kind of dealing with it. And so Paul rebuked them. Second Corinthians, now he's coming back and saying, okay, good, we've dealt with that, <laughs> right? Uh, you guys have repented, you know, you've restored, you're, you need to restore that brother that was in that sin. And now let's move on. And uh, what he says in chapter 7 is, let's begin that, that work of perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And so that is my theme for the whole year. That is what the Lord has just really gripped me with, this idea of holiness. You're seeing it in our songs that we're singing uh, just this, man, think about holiness. And I, we did that one song this morning. Did you like that, Holy? Yeah. Uh, you know, thinking about God and how separate he is and how incredibly awesome he is and how we are not, you know, yeah. at all. And, uh, and, and so the idea of God saying, you know, separate yourselves from the world and come and, and, and be holy. And it's just such... Uh, an incredibly important thing for us in the days that we're living in. As the world and the church is really taking this left-wing approach to things, and, and, you know, the church has become more and more apostate as the years have gone by, and uh, really the, the world has seeped into the church and begun to infect the church. And, and so more so than ever, I think, we've got to just be separate God says, come out from among them, you know, and be separate. And, uh, and so that's on my heart. And so that's the whole theme behind this Second Corinthians study that we're doing here. And so I hope you catch that. But uh, we're just in chapter one. Haven't made it through chapter one yet. We're just taking our time getting through there. Uh, verse 12 through 24 is what we're looking at here today. So if you follow along with me there, <clears throat> Paul says... For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but the grace of God, but by the grace of God, and more abundantly toward you. For we are not writing any other thing to you than what you read or understand. Now I trust you will understand even to the end as also you have understood us in part, that we are your boast and you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. And in this confidence, I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit to pass by way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh that with me there should be yes, yes and no, no. But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no for the son of God, uh, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus and Timothy 
was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us in God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul that to spare you I came no more to Corinth. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but are fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to study it, Lord, but not just in an intellectual way, but Father, these words would penetrate our hearts, penetrate our minds, set us free, Father God. Help us to love each other more and more. Help us to serve you in sincerity and in truth. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you see the title I put on there today, Yes and Amen. It's kind of a riddle, the way that Paul reads it. I know you're probably looking and going, what in the world is he saying? That's what I've been saying all week. What in the world is he saying? What is he talking about? Well, it goes pretty deep, and we'll get into it, but uh, uh, I just want to look at these two words in particular here, boasting and benefits, I think is a good way of laying it out for us here today. Boasting and benefits, Paul said, our boast is you. You, the church in Corinth, and your boast is us, or it should be us. We have this relationship with each other, and, and so there shouldn't be division with each other. We need to uh, help each other as we go through this life, because why? In the end, when we stand before the Lord, on the day of the Lord, the day of Jesus Christ, he says, when we're on that judgment seat, uh, that Bema seat of judgment, the only thing that will matter is how we've built onto that foundation that Jesus Christ has laid, right? We can build on that foundation wood, hay, and stubble, and it's all going to be burned up. Or we can build onto that foundation with gold and silver and precious gems, things that will matter and that will stand the test of time for all of eternity. And those things, Paul says right here, are how you and I in the church, in the body of Christ, interact with each other. How we love each other, our boast or our rejoicing is what he's really saying there, is our relationships with each other. And I think it's a very powerful uh, thing to think about here. Again, as we have kind of started out this book, I told you some reasons that Paul has written this book, and there are many. And that's why you, you can't really come up with, a, this is what this book's about, because there are many things that Paul addresses in this book. And uh, last week, we looked at the idea of emboldening the, the church there uh, to endure suffering for the joy of deliverance. And uh, that's really what the whole first chapter has been about to this point is the idea of, hey, we go through suffering, and if you're going to live a, a godly life in this world, in the days that we're living in, if you're going to stand for Jesus Christ in the time that you're living in, you will suffer persecution. Uh, but in that suffering, God will come, and he will pour out his comfort upon you, and through the body of Christ, we can all get through this together, is essentially what he's saying. There's comfort that comes. The more that we suffer, the more comfort comes, and, uh, and we should be praying for each other, and all those things is what we dealt with last week. Uh, again, there's a lot of other things he deals with. He, he deals with the idea of forgiving that person that was in sin, restoring them. We'll get to that eventually. Paul has to kind of establish or reestablish his own authority as an apostle because there are people coming in to the church that are challenging that authority, and we'll look at a little bit of that today. Uh, he needs to encourage them to share their relief offerings and all that kind of stuff. But today, we're looking at this idea of, of Paul having to explain his inconsistent actions. He has told them in a previous letter, I'm going to come down from Macedonia, like I did the last time, and I'm going to come and see you guys again. Uh, I want to come and I want to encourage you. I know I wrote you a really harsh letter once before. I know it was harsh. It needed to be, though. You know, I know, I know you guys are kind of 
hurting from that letter that I wrote, but I want to come and I want to be a benefit to you. I want to come and I want to bless you again. And so he had written that he was going to come again, but then he didn't. And so now the enemies of Paul have said, ha ha, look, see, Paul is a flip-flopper. You know, he's just a politician. He's just a guy who likes to talk. He says big words, but he doesn't come and back up those words with his presence. And, uh, and so they're calling into question Paul as the apostle because of this little flip-flop that he made. And so that's why he's saying, you know, my word to you was yes, yes. It wasn't yes and no. I wasn't saying, yes, I'm going to come, and then no, I didn't come. And that's why you see that little riddle there, <laughs> language. Uh, that's what Paul is dealing with. He's saying, look, uh, just as God is faithful, and just as the promises of God are faithful, I did not want to mislead you. I have a very specific reason for why I didn't come. And he tells it to us to them at the very end of this chapter. I didn't come because I didn't want to come when you were still in your sin and have to come down hard on you once again. And so I deliberately stayed away, is what he eventually says. And so in all of that, those things help us, you and I, here in the body of Christ, to deal with each other. We have to deal with each other in sincerity and, and godliness and simplicity, not duplicity, is the whole idea of saying one thing and not doing it. Uh, all of those things are things that we, on a day-to-day -day basis, have to hold as we deal with each other. Why? Because in the end, when we stand before the Lord, our relationships are those things that are made of gold, those things that are made of silver, those things that are made of, of precious gems, those are the things that we're building on that foundation that Jesus Christ has laid. And in the end, our boast of each other is the only thing that's really going to matter. How we've interacted with each other, how we've interacted with that world out there, have we conducted ourselves in simplicity and, and uh, righteousness, or have we acted in other ways? And so it's very important, I think, uh, what Paul is saying here, and we'll kind of get through the difficult language of how he says it. But again, let's go back and look at that first verse there. He says, um, our boasting is this. You, you get that kind of from what he has said. He has said, you know, we, when we were going through that suffering, when we were going through those difficult times, uh, and, and we needed your prayers, and you sent those prayers, and, and God delivered us. It wasn't ourselves, and we didn't deliver ourselves. God delivered us, and you helped in that deliverance by praying for us so much. And that gift of deliverance finally came. But Paul says, but our boast, our boast is this, that we conducted ourselves in the right way. Our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly toward you. And so Paul says it's our conscience is clear. We don't have a conscience that is impure. We feel that we did conduct ourselves in the right way. We weren't telling lies. We weren't trying to mislead you or anything like that. And so this word boasting, people stumble over this a little bit. Boasting? I thought we weren't supposed to brag and boast and be all that. Well, it's the good kind, right? It's the good kind of boasting. Used negatively, it, it refers to unwanted, unwa unwarranted excuse me, bragging about one's own merits and achievements. Uh, but Paul used it in a, in positively to denote legitimate confidence in what God has done in his life. And so it's the idea more of glorying in what God has done or rejoicing in what God has done. And so when he says that word boasting, which he says many times in the uh, New King James, I'll just warn you of that. I think he's like six or seven times he uses that, that term. But he's talking about I'm glorying or I'm rejoicing in what God has done in our relationships and, and the ministry that I'm doing and, and our, your part in that ministry and how you guys are interacting in that. I'm rejoicing in what God has done. I'm not bragging about myself. I rejoice in what God has accomplished. And again, looking forward to that time where we stand before the Lord and rejoice about what he has done in our lives. But he says our boasting in that place. 
Uh, I quoted some Henry Foster for you last week. Found a couple more quotes from him that were good, I think. Uh, this idea of sincerity and, uh, you know, in godliness, you know, how we conducted ourselves in the world, you know, oftentimes we're alone in this uh, approach to walk in this righteous way. We don't have a lot of people behind us saying, yeah, yeah, you're doing the right thing as you walk with the Lord and as you walk through this life in a righteous way. And so his quote here is dealing with that idea of uh, uh, simplicity of life and godly sincerity. Uh, Majorities, he says, do not settle morals for the Christian. He may have a solitary, singular, uh, or he may have to be solitary and singular with nobody on his side or agreeing with his judgment. But then look what he says. Except his master above him and his judge within him. He's talking about his conscience, right? We boast about this, that our conscience is clear. Even though the ungodly world is mad at us and they hate us and they want to see us fall, uh, but even people in the church are upset with me right now, Paul's saying. But I have this confidence in my heart that in my integrity, in my, uh, my conduct with people, I have done the right thing. My conscience is clear. I know before the Lord, my master above me, and this judge within me, I have done the right thing in this. And so that's what he's saying there. If you catch that, uh, C.S. Lewis has that great quote, integrity is doing the right thing even when no one's watching, right? That's what it's all about. Can you have a conscience that is clear? Because I tell you, walking with the Lord, there's nothing like having a clear conscience. There is nothing like it. On the flip side, it's so horrible when you're saying one thing and being the hypocrite and doing something else on the side when nobody knows about it. It's so hard to walk with the Lord when that is going on in your life. And so just keeping those accounts clean with the Lord, if you have sinned, deal with it immediately. Get it out of there. (laughs) Repent of that sin. Confess that sin to the Lord and get up and keep on walking. You don't want your conscience Hag, you know, hanging on saying, oh yeah, you're saying this, but I know what you did, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's no fun. It's no fun. And it's hard to walk through this life as a, as a Christian that wants to see good fruit happening in their lives. Integrity is doing the right thing when no one's watching. And I think that's a great way to uh, illustrate that point. And so uh, moving on from there, Paul in chapter 12, he says this in simplicity in godly sincerity. Simplicity, again, is the opposite of duplicity. And that's what he's being accused of. And that's what he means by simplicity. Uh, Obviously, uh, as Christians, sometimes we can live very complicated lives. We're doing this, and we got to take the kids over here and do this, and we got so many things going on that the Lord and serving him is just a part of that. Oh, yeah, well, on Wednesday, i got to go do my thing with the Lord, but the rest of the time, I'm doing all this other worldly stuff. And, and there's that idea of complexity in your life and you, you need to simplify things just so you can have time to read your Bible and, and serve the Lord, you know. And so Christians need to deal with that. But he's really dealing with this idea of I'm not living a, a, a duplicity kind of a situation here. I am living in a simple way and uh, I'm saying one thing and that's what I'm doing as well. And godly sincerity. Sincerity, or the word sincere, Uh, Pastor Chuck tells a great illustration about this idea of sincerity. The word sincere is an old word that means no wax. No wax. Back in the day in the Greco-Roman world, they would make statues out of marble. And, uh, you know, they'd be chipping away on that, that marble and trying to finish that statue. And all of a sudden they would cut off the nose or cut off a finger or something as they chip away at that marble. Now what are you going to do? The whole statue's ruined, right? No, we could take some wax and we can mold and shape that wax into a finger or a nose or whatever is knocked off. And nobody will know until they take that statue home and then on a hot day, all of a sudden the nose melts off the face. That's not a sincere way to deal with your customers, is it? No wax means, hey, what I say is what I do and what I do is what I say and I'm not trying to deceive anybody. I'm not trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. 
I am living a life of sincerity, of godly sincerity in the fear of the Lord. And so that's what he's talking about there, is that idea of godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. Hey, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, just like you guys are, and uh, I'm going to admit that to you. I'm not trying to, you know, use my mind and, and godly, uh, ungodly wisdom or fleshly wisdom to get through this. I am using godly wisdom. Being led by the Holy Spirit, another way to put it. Uh, Psalm 44, 6. I was reading that this week, and uh, I just really came across this idea uh, of just um, not looking to myself, not looking to myself to save myself. Uh, in the Psalm, David says, I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me, but you have saved us from our enemies and have put to shame those who hate us. In God we boast all day long and praise your name forever. Selah. And again, that Selah is just think about that for a minute. Think about that. I don't trust in myself. I know that within myself there is no good thing. Within my flesh, I will fail miserably. I will fall. I will let you down. You will let me down. But we can deal with those things. We can deal with those things. We can ask for forgiveness from each other. We can say we're sorry. We can deal with each other in sincerity when we mess up. And, uh, of course, God will forgive us when we ask him to forgive us. And so that, that just total trust in the Lord and not in ourselves, my boast is in him all day long, all day long. I cannot trust in myself because I know I will fail miserably. And so that's what that, that's, uh, that idea on there. He goes on, though, in that chapter, interestingly enough, to say, yet for your sake, for the Lord's sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Awake, why do you sleep, O Lord? Arise, do not cast us off forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? It goes again back to what Paul has been dealing with. I trust in the Lord even when it doesn't seem like he's answering my prayers. I'm going through this very difficult time. I'm suffering. I'm getting beaten. I'm out in the ocean. Think about that. When Paul's out spreading the gospel around the ancient world, and then he's out there in the ocean bobbing up and down for a day and a half. Uh, Any time now, Lord, you know, you could send a boat by. You know, our timing is not God's timing, is it? We are in that place of saying, Lord, wake up, help, <laughs> arise, help me, come and save me right now. But again, through those times of suffering, through those times of difficulty and, and tribulation, he's trying to teach us that patience. He's trying to teach us that just hold on. The Lord's got something going on here and you're a part of it. So just deal with it and endure it. And the Lord will eventually comfort you and bring you out of that place. But uh, the whole idea there is trusting in the Lord in those times, in those difficult times. And so in verse 13 then, we better get going here. For we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. Now I trust you will understand even to the end, as also you have understood us in part, that we are your boast as you, are, as you also are ours in the day of the Lord. Jesus. And so again, um, what he's saying there, you know, hey, we've written you several letters now. We haven't changed anything. We are saying the same things. We're not being duplicitous or any of those kind of things. But again, he says, I want you to know you are our boast. We are your boast. We have this relationship together. And in the end, on the judgment seat of Christ, that will, will be all that really matters is how we have conducted ourselves in this life. Have we built upon that solid foundation or not? We are your boast, and you also are ours. Imagine that. You know, I, I read that this week, and it, it just kind of shook me a little bit. I've been involved in ministry for over 20 years now, and I've had some pretty tough relationships with people in the church, other believers, you know, had people leave the church, we've left churches, we've caused problems in churches, I've caused problems, not my wife, 
I did it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I was telling some people a story just not too long ago. We had the cops called on us, my first Calvary Chapel, and said, now you guys need to leave. You guys are causing all kinds of problems here. Long story. But anyway, um, <laughs> you know, our relationships with each other. I know that, you know, there are people here that have struggled in church. And you have even got a bad idea about what church is about. I just don't go to church anymore. A bunch of hypocrites over there. Yeah, yeah, true. We're all hypocrites to some degree or not. Uh, isn't that important for us to conduct ourselves in a better way? Are you going to learn that out in the world? Because they're better at it? Nope. <laughs> the world's, yeah, they're not, they're not hypocrites, though. They're, they're good. They're good. They're righteous. They're all doing the right thing. No, we're, we're all human. We're all frail. We all have those kind of issues. Uh, and, and so we need to work on those issues together. And how we interact with each other, you know, it, it's going to really matter big time in the end. Uh, and I feel bad about some of the relationships I've had. I mean, they've not been sincere. They have not been genuine. They have not been godly. They have been, uh, you know, I was acting in fleshly wisdom. Oh, here's what we need to do. We need to just tell that person to leave, you know. <laughs> Those kind of things. I mean, we just struggle in the church because we're all human beings. And we fight with each other and we divide things and divide over things uh, and, and cause problems in the church. And so, man, we just have to come to this place of recognizing that our conduct with each other in God's eyes, it's really, really important that we act right with each other in the church. Of course, they're going to treat each other that way. And that's why Jesus says, you know, hey, uh, you know, even the world, even people in the world treat each other better than that, you know, and, and how much more so those who have the Spirit of God dwelling in them, should they treat each other in, in righteousness. And so it's important that uh, we, we think about these things. And I just encourage you this week, you know, if, if you've wronged someone in the church, you know, Jesus tells us exactly what to do. You go and you say you're sorry to that person. Hold on to that gift that you're about to give to the Lord and go and say, you know, I'm really sorry that I've hurt you and... Uh, I just want to make things right with you. Same thing, you know, if you know that somebody's done something to you and you're just, oh, that person, I just never want to talk to them again. You know, they better come and say they're sorry to me or I'm never going to talk to them again. You know, we kind of wait for them to come. No, the Bible doesn't let you out that way, does it? It says, go to that person, go to that brother, tell them what they've done and make it right. Get it right. Get right with each other and then get right with the Lord. And uh, that is the clear instruction that we've been given in Scripture. And so um, moving on to verse 14 there, uh, or we're still in verse 14, I guess. Um, in the day of the Lord. And again, and we've talked about that quite a bit already, being on the judgment seat of Christ. But let's move on now. And we're going to talk about this idea of the benefits that Paul wants to bring. Paul wants to come back to that church and bless those people, you know, and instruct them in the word and build them up even more in their faith. And uh, he receives a mutual benefit from them. And so um, this quote here, Paul was certain that the judgment seat of Christ, uh, that at the judgment seat of Christ, he would rejoice over the Corinthian believers and they would rejoice over him. Whatever misunderstanding there may be today, when we stand before Jesus Christ, all will be forgiven, forgotten, and transformed into glory to the praise of Jesus Christ. And again, that's the whole idea of, of the judgment seat of Christ. And, um, you know, it won't really matter much then. But again, if we've had these horrible relationships and haven't made them right, uh, that's going to take away from that little uh, crown on, you know, that little stone on your crown, maybe. I don't know. You know, we know about these crowns that we're going to get for righteousness. Uh, I don't know what, how that's all going to work out. But we know that Jesus says, hey, if you don't forgive people, I'm not going to forgive you. Whoa, what's that all about? You know, it's important. God wants us to deal with our relationships in a very serious way. And so that verse 15 there. Uh, and in this confidence, I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit. And so 
uh, this confidence, the confidence that I have that you and I are in this relationship together, that you and I have this forgiving relationship. That's the confidence. I was coming back to you knowing that even though I wrote that very harsh letter to you, that you guys were going to repent, that you were going to understand what I was saying and, and, and repent of that and make things right and do the things that I had asked you to do to make things right in that church there that I planted in Corinth. And I was going to come back and we were going to be able to have that relationship again and, and just uh, glory in what the Lord's doing there. But again, he says in the end, I didn't come though because you guys had not repented yet. You were still in that place of, of walking in fleshly desires. And, and so I didn't want to come until you guys have dealt with that. Uh, and so he says, I had this confidence I was going to come. But uh, the idea of a second benefit, um, we think about just all the things that Paul has given us in the New Testament. And what a benefit those are to us living today. I mean, think about the, the revelations that Paul had been given. And, uh, and what we find in the whole New Testament. I mean, he wrote almost three quarters of the New Testament. And I don't, I don't know about you, but when I read his writings, I mean, it just stirs in me. Because the Holy Spirit is speaking through his words and, and instructing me and correcting me and rebuking me. And those are benefits in my life. Those are extreme benefits in my life and, and in your life. And so Paul said, I have more I want to tell you. But I couldn't because you're babes in Christ. I mean, you still need me to feed you some milk. I want to come and bring the steak, you know, and, and feed you that, that, that serious meat that you need to grow in a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. But I couldn't. I couldn't do that because you weren't ready for it. You just weren't ready for the meat of the word yet. You were still in your sin, and I was waiting to hear from one of my brothers that, okay, they've repented, Paul. They're, they're in the right place. Now you can you know, go over there or you can send that second letter. And that's what we find here. It's a second benefit. But there's also the benefit that comes from that church to Paul as he recognizes there's a mutual benefit. And, and he talks about that in a couple different places. Back in 1 Corinthians 9, he said, if we have sown spir some spiritual, or if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing that we reap material things from you? No, Paul didn't find a problem with that at all. He said, you know, I'm giving you things that are life-changing. I am giving you the, the things that God has given me that have totally changed my life and changed the lives of thousands of people across the land. And I'm giving those things to you and they're changing your life as well. And so it's no big deal if you help me on my way as I come through town and you, you know, maybe cook me a meal or something, let me stay the night at your house and then send me on my way so I can make it down to Jerusalem to bless those saints down there with an offering that we've taken from all the churches in this area. And so Paul said, you know, it's, it's worth something, these spiritual benefits that I'm giving and, uh, and he said, I want to come back a second time and, and pour out all those things upon you there. And so the benefits that come, uh, he wanted to pass in verse 16, he says, I want to pass uh, by way of you to Macedonia to come again from Macedonia to you and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Again, he's taking an offering down there for the poor saints in Jerusalem. And so there's that. Um, we're not going to spend any time on that. But again, that's the mutual benefit. Uh, I knew if I was able to come through there that you guys would bless the, the work that I'm trying to do in the ministry and help me out by helping me get down to uh, Judea, which is, you know, financial. There's a financial need there for supporting Paul's ministry. Uh, as you travel, you need money to travel. And so it's, he's just stating that in a very uh, logical way. And so, uh, let's see, I think we're going to verse 17. No, we've got a quote from Matthew in here. This is talking about this little riddle that Paul is dealing with. As Jesus says, you know, let your yes be yes. And he said there in Matthew 5, let your yes be yes and your no, no. Don't add anything to that. Don't beg people, oh, please, please, you got to believe me, you know, that kind of stuff. Hey, yes, that's my word. My word is yes. And I don't have to do a tap dance. I just let my yes be yes, my no, no. 
For whatever is more than these things is from the evil one. You know, it's a duplicitous thing from Satan to, to constantly be uh, trying to say more than just your, your simple word of yes. And so uh, in verse 17, or 18 actually, how do we skip 17? Come on, Glenn. Uh, well, let's look at 17 because that's a very important one. I, I think I just mislabeled it. But therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I, do, do I plan according to the flesh? That with me, there should be yes, yes, and no, no. But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, uh, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. So again, it's, it's kind of a, a strange thing, the way he's saying this, but it comes across as this idea of being duplicitous. You know, he says in verse 17, I was plan did, did I plan this in the flesh? This whole trip that I was planning, do you think I just, uh, you know, lightly planned this thing and expected things to turn out right and that I was going to make it? No, I, I sat down and with the Lord, you know, tried to plan these things out in a way that would be beneficial to you. My whole plan was to come down in that route that I'd come before and to bless you. Uh, and so I wasn't trying to pull the wool over your eyes. But again, he says in verse 18, God is faithful. God is faithful, and, and I want to, in, in every way that I can, act in the same way that God has. God is faithful. Our word to you was not yes and no, um, but it was yes. For all the promises of God are yes. They're all amen. There is no duplicity in God, is what he's saying. There is no duplicity in the message of Christ. And all of the truths that we find, all of the promises that God has made from the very beginning all the way through to the end, from Genesis all the way through Revelation, all those promises are ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And he said, when I was preaching Jesus Christ, did I give you any indication that that wasn't the case? No, I told you the gospel. I preached the gospel to you from the beginning to the end, and it was all yes, yes, yes. And the idea of amen is let it be. That's the, uh, the Hebrew way of saying yes. Yes, I believe that. Amen. Let it be or so let it be. That whole idea of saying amen. The promises of God in Christ, they're all yes. There is no duplicity in Christ. It's only sincerity. It's only genuineness is what Paul is, is ultimately saying there. And uh, I wanted to put that in the amplified version for you just to bring it out a little bit more. He says, as many as are the promises of God, they all find, yet, find their yes or their answer in him, in Christ. For this reason, we also utter the amen or so be it to God through him in his person and by his agency to the glory of God. All of the promises of God, they come, they come through Jesus Christ, and he is the one that ultimately fulfills those promises. And so Paul is saying, I, I've tried to keep my message just as simple as that. In, in the same way that I've preached Christ to you, and the genuineness of Christ, and the, the true nature of that message of the gospel, that is the same way I've tried to conduct my own personal affairs in dealing with you guys. And so um, verse 21, and, and then we'll kind of wrap up the rest here. Now, he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And what a, what a statement that is. All of the things that God has done for us, all the promises that he has given us, through Jesus Christ. What are some of them? Just some of them, but so powerful. He established us in an eternal light. We are permanently established in our salvation through Jesus Christ. He anointed us, or the whole idea of the Holy Spirit coming and, and filling us and anointing us with his truth 
And, uh, and then the idea of sealing us is, is permanently putting us into that place. Um, you know, I don't want to get into the whole once saved, always saved debate. Uh, it's out there in the church, you know, and, and the whole idea, well, I'm saved, so nothing matter, matters. I can live my life in any old way, you know, and I'm, once I was saved, I'm always saved no matter what. My question is, were you really saved in the first place? <laughs> Because if you were really saved in the first place, you were saved before the foundation of the earth was laid. And, and so, you know, the whole idea of losing your salvation. No, I don't think you can lose your salvation. I think you, you are sealed in the Lord. But were you saved in the first place? And if you were saved in the first place, there are some fruit that should be coming from your life that indicate, yeah, you truly are established in Christ. You are anointed by the Lord. You are sealed in that place. And so there's that argument. I don't want to get into that. We could talk about that for a month. But um, <laughs> these are some of the things that Christ has done through, through uh, his promises, through God's promises. These are the things that, that God has done for us. He has been faithful to do these things. And the last statement there uh, even heightens that. He's given us the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, in our hearts as a guarantee he has placed the Holy Spirit there to say, look, this is just a down payment. This is just a down payment of what God is ultimately going to do, and that is to take you from this place into eternity uh, in his presence. And uh, the Holy Spirit is just that, that down payment, that guarantee that we have been given. And so Paul says, you know, those are the things that I'm trying to uh, accomplish in my ministry. That's the kind of honesty that I want to bring to you in my ministry. That's the kind of way I want to live and, and interact with other believers is in the same way that God is so holy and righteous and honest and simple and uh, lack of duplicity. That is the same way I want to interact with you. And again, it's the same way you and I should want to interact with each other in the same way that God interacts with us. He doesn't say one thing and do something else, does he? No, he established us. He is the same today, or yesterday, today, and forever. That's what the Bible says. And that Holy Spirit that he's given us is just a down payment of that truth. And so, a uh, couple more things here. Henry Foster again. The promissory note is in itself a nearly valueless piece of rather special make of paper. But the credit is that of the credible the solvent institution behind it. That piece of paper that you have in your pocket or in your wallet, it's really valueless unless the institution behind it can back it up, can be credible. Now, we can go all kinds of places with that, can't we? <laughs> we hope our nation is going to remain solvent <laughs> for, you know, very far into the future. It's in doubt, I know. Um, but uh, it, it gives you a good sense of this promise. If you make a promise, but then you can't back it up. If you tell somebody something, but your character is one of insolvency, and you don't have the credibility to back up that promise, your promise is worthless. And so therefore, you have to go around saying, oh, yes, 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 that's what I wanted. You know, that's my promise to you. You have to say more things to add on to that because you don't have any credibility. If you have credibility, if you've been faithful, if you've been a, a person of, of integrity, if you've been a person of, of honesty and in truth, then you don't have to say anything more than yes. That's it. That's all you have to say is one word, yes. You don't have to beg or plead with somebody to believe you. The real guarantee and ground of its helpfulness lies in the faithfulness of God himself. God's promises are given to us in his word. He has backed them up over and over and over again. We looked at it last week. He has delivered me in the past. He's going to deliver me now in the present. And he will deliver me again in the future. I know because he's credible. I can trust his credibility. And I don't have to worry about the insolvency of the Lord. And so uh, closing there, he finally gives us the reason he didn't come. He finally gives us in verse 23, Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul that to spare you I came no more 
to Corinth. I didn't come back in the way I said I was going to because you weren't ready for me to come back. And I wanted to spare you from having to go again in face, face to face, and rebuke you in the same way of that first Corinthian letter that I wrote to you. You were still in your sin. You weren't ready for me to come. Had I come, I would have to say the things I said in that letter to you face to face. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to spare you. I wanted to give you the time to repent of those things. And so that's why I didn't come. It wasn't because I'm uh, dishonest. And so there in 24, he says, not that we have dominion over your faith, but are fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. And that is such an important thing for us to grasp here today as well. You know, we are just fellow workers with each other. I mean, I don't know what kind of tradition you grew up in in the church, but I am nothing, <laughs> okay? I am a fellow worker with you, just trying to get through this mess together and uh, understand it, understand the way God that has given it to us in his word, and we are just here to help each other in that process. Fellow workers for our joy until we're with him in that place of eternity. Paul finally explained why he said he was coming but did not. He did not come earlier because he wanted the Corinthian believers to have time to repent and correct their sinful behavior. And so we looked at that already. But that, that final point there, we're fellow workers for each other's joy. And... Uh, you know, what a great message for us here in the coming year. I do think that we're going to go through a lot of very strenuous, stressful times in the future, and we're going to need each other. We're going to need each other to be there for each other, to comfort each other, and to encourage each other, to pray for each other, and, uh, and help that joy uh, just be manifested as we share together with each other. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you again for this opportunity to come and uh, just sit and sit at your feet as Mary did and hear your word being taught. But Father, just to take that in as a benefit, as a rebuke if we need it, as an encouragement as we need it. Lord, we ask that as we go forward from here, we would have hearts that are sincere, not full of wax. Father, that we would say what we mean to say and do what we have said we're going to do. As we interact with each other, as we uh, go through this life together, that we would be iron that sharpens iron, yes, but also an agent of comforting for each other as we go through hard times. And so, Father, we praise you for that. We honor you for it. We glorify you, Lord, in Jesus' name.